everybody, I'm Larry Rose and welcome to Larry Rose Live. Today we'll discuss a topic that's been simmering for a while and it's really starting to hit a boiling point. It's going to touch each and every one of us. I'm talking about IoT, the Internet of Things. But what exactly is the Internet of Things? Does it provide value to business? Are organizations even ready for IoT? Joining us tonight to help us answer these questions and many more, Andre Kindness. Thank you. A well-known analyst for Forrester Research, specializing in business outcomes and IoT, and Hater Ferroni. Hi, Larry. He is Alcatel Lucent Enterprises' IoT architect and thought leader. So welcome, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. a pleasure to be here. All right, let's get started. Andre, what exactly is IoT and what value does it bring to businesses? You know, Forrester finds IoT as a set of technologies connecting mechanical and electrical things across uh, a network fabric, a business network fabric, we saw the internet change the way w businesses run. We've seen how mobile phones have changed businesses and actually new businesses have risen out of this, the online business, or even inside of a retail or a hospital. There's so many things that IoT will change across all the industries out there. That's the most important thing, what IoT really means, is it's a new business paradigm for a lot of these uh, corporations out there and these enterprise companies. So, Hator, let's talk about some of the benefits of IoT and exactly who reaps these benefits. Will it be businesses in terms of these new business opportunities, or will it be consumers? You know, when you talk about benefits of IoT, I think the sky is the limit. Mm -hmm. um, and we're just seeing the start, isn't it? we're in the very infancy of this phenomenon. And, you know, in this initial stage, most of the benefits that you see is from the operational side or or... Mm -hmm you know, making it uh, new ways to engage with customers, um, improving the services that you offer, improving the productivity. But as Andre uh, mentioned, you know, we're going to see also in the future new business model coming up, new companies that we never imagined. So it's large potential. And the other interesting thing that I see is that uh, the push for this technology, this movement, is not coming from IT. It's not IT pushing to the organizations this new technology. It's actually the business units, the different divisions that see a clear ROI and are coming to IT and saying, hey, I have these interesting new devices that I want to connect. Please make it happen. So it's a change in the perspective how the dynamics work in, in the corporations. So it's going to have a big impact on IT as well as business units and then consumers and the world at large will also uh, see a lot of benefits from IoT. Yeah, every day in our life, the things we use in our house will be completely different the way we interact with it already today. We have garage doors opening as soon as you start to approach them. So you can imagine this whole entire environment being completely different moving forward, this physical world really reacting to who we are based on this technology. How do companies get themselves organized for this? That's a great question because I think if you think about it, the seismic changes happening outside of the business or you know in the consumer life and the business world itself is going to be carried over to the organizations internally. No longer are we going to have these demarcation zones of technology owned by IT mm -hmm. uh, where the business kind of sends over the wall the things that they need and then IT comes up with it. You're going to see much more of a meshing between the two worlds because the reality is IoT on an oil platform, the technology connecting uh, the rig and the, the pressure systems and stuff like that requires a process engineer and a mechanical engineer intimately working with IT mm. and fundamentally what that means is your metrics and your standards of process and procedures have to be much more oriented to the business side and, and meshing of the two worlds coming together so across the board I'm going to see, we're going to see some significant changes on the organizations the way that they're laid out and who, resp who reports to who and uh, what they have to actually develop and you know who they answer to ultimately hopefully the customer but the reality is you'll see a blending of IT and, uh, and the business side itself. So um, IT gets pushed out into the business unit. Hater, is there still a role for a centralized IT group or um, is it all going to be pushed out into those business units? It does because uh, IT, uh, if you look at the overall universe of IoT, you have all kinds of IoT devices connecting to systems uh, that analyze the data. Um, you know, you have devices connecting to devices, talking to applications in the data center, mm. interfacing with the CRM systems, or even going beyond to the cloud or to other business partners. So IT has to start planning a, a foundation, an infrastructure that can provide this connectivity. 
And then they have to think about security, about uh, reaching all kinds of areas in your corporation, right? Because many of these will be outdoors as well. So how do you connect? What technologies you use? You know, how you establish best practices? So definitely, I believe IT is going to be a central point of this revolution. And they need to start planning right away because this is something that if they don't get ready now, by the time that uh, all these devices come in, they're going to be caught in a really troublesome environment, right? So IT is already really worried about IT security these days. Mm -hmm. And now we're adding Internet of Things to that. And we've seen some reports about uh, some botnet attacks and DDoS attacks caused by IoT. What, is, what about the security? Can we make these things hacker-proof? Um, yes, uh, but it's not simple. I, I believe that the same way that IoT has you know, unlimited benefits, the size of the problems can be enormous, right? And as you mentioned, the recent uh, denial service attack to one of the DNS servers uh, brought half of the, a good portion of the internet down. Mm -hmm. Because now you're gonna have billions of devices uh, that can be affected. And uh, the interesting thing that we observed is many of the IoT device vendors don't have the knowledge of the expertise about security. All they care is about, I need to connect these devices and provide information to the system that controls them. And there are many reasons. Sometimes they don't know about security. Sometimes the devices are so simple that there is no memory. There is not enough processing to do the best practice in security or sometimes they just don't have the budget and the R&D because this is extra cost for that uh, companies. So IT somehow needs to think about this environment and try to compensate or get ready, get prepared with a, you know, multiple solutions that are available in the market. I would even add that if you think about it, you put on top of it, your new companies out there, IoT, don't come from the technology side. So now you have companies offering PLCs and actuators and sensors and temperature sensors, which come from your traditional smoke snack industries. They don't have a call center. They don't have a security team looking out and for bugs. I worked with an HVAC company that actually had an issue with their controller on top of uh, hospitals that were controlling the HVAC systems for four years, but they don't have a mechanism to let their customers know or to update the systems out there because their traditional customer was the HVAC equipment engineer or the facilities manager engineer. They don't have the same process and procedures set up. You typically see a software company that has software updates and bugs. It goes out to the IT team they've already prepared and goes out. If there's issues, they have a call center. This HVAC company didn't have a call center around their software and, and dealing with security or even the security team to go out and check all the bugs on the software side. So you think about your companies like GE and Siemens, I mean, they've got to all transition their internal business to support this new technology world where technology vendors have already come this way and have this kind of built in there. You have this other side of the industry coming into technology that has to re-change their organizations and their business and processes on this side. So yeah, from a security standpoint, I mean, there could be a lot of holes because they don't set themselves up in that methods of finding them letting their customers know about them, being able to deal with it. This is a whole new business model that they have to prepare for from, from that side of the industry. So the entire world out there, every business out there that wants to be digitalized or, or offer IoT solutions has to think about a, the way and IT technology companies have been doing this for the last 20 or 30 years. They've got to change their process, procedures, and directions, and, pro and what they do as, as a company delivering the right value and services. So. Yeah, I think the security piece is going to be reorganizing and resetting how companies are coming to the market itself once they want to get into the IoT business. And now that you mentioned about uh, the air conditioner, I remember the example many years ago of Target, right? They mm -hmm. had uh, some people hacking or getting access to the network through the air conditioning system, and they end up getting the information, you know, the payment credit cards from millions of users. And IT needs even to rethink the security techniques and uh, practices that they use. Because it's not enough anymore to just put a firewall and you're, you're safe. Right? You have to do what we call the multi-layer approach. Mm -hmm. Where you know, there are techniques today like from the network access control to IoT containment. Even DPI. Right? So you have multiple techniques right, to try to minimize the risk of a cyber attack, right? You're never yeah. gonna be 100%, but at least you can 
drag them down to a level that is uh, you know, possible to deal with. Well, I think you bring up a good point too about that HVAC company coming into Target. The reality is when we were having this discussion earlier, the new business out there is about multiple companies serving that customer, right? So now with IoT, what about those light bulbs in there? Well, in changing that business model, you see GE and Philips offering that they'll service the light bulbs and you just pay for what you use. They need to get into that network and they need to monitor things. If you have HVAC company getting into what about the doors, what about the security cameras, now you have multiple companies coming in and with IoT, and so you have to really create this multi-tenant environment. So that really changes the network architecture, the mindset, the process and procedures around that as well. So I mean, it's just, it completely just resets. It's a revolution of the network and the IT infrastructure and the operations. Um, where we see what IT is going to be delivering to the business and ultimately, as you pointed out, to the customer and customer experience. It's a good thing that we're thinking about these security things now so that as the business grows and as the market grows, uh, we can have a new infrastructure in place that is secure. Uh, maybe, you know, add another 10,000 billion uh, passwords to our <laughs> things that we have to change every quarter. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll that's one, that. one of the steps because <laughs> I think the recent uh, denial of service attack, part of the issue was that people just keep the default username yeah. and password. So yeah. practice as simple as that are important to be observed as well. Right. Yeah. That's a lot of post-its around my monitor now. <laughs> <laughs> Your passwords. Yeah. Are there anything else that companies should think about as we enter into this IoT era? Uh, yes, and I think when you say revolutionary, people are underestimating how revolutionary it can be. And um, I believe that the IoT is going to be as transformational as, as it was the event of the Internet and all these smartphones and enterprise mobility. You know, take examples like Uber, how it affected the taxi industry, right? And many others, right? WhatsApp and uh, uh, Waze. So if you are not prepared, your company may even disappear, mm. right? So this is something to be taken, I think, seriously and start preparing right away. I think it's spot on. It's uh, companies life and death situation now. Well, this has been a great conversation. When we come back, Andre and Hator will take your calls about the implications of the Internet of Things later on on Larry Rose Live. Internet of Things for Hospitality, brought to you by Alcatel-Lucent Enterprise. And we're back. We're discussing the Internet of Things with Andre Kindness from Forrester Research Group and Hader Peroni of Alcatel Lucent Enterprise. Let's get to some of our callers. Caller number one is Professor Amy Smart from Sharp Minds University. Professor Smart, you're on the air. Hi, Larry. Love your show. I'm a university professor and I teach robotics. I'm always adding new devices and new technology to our university network. Everything from student fitness devices to temperature sensors in dorms and classrooms. However, I always have a dickens of a time trying to connect them. My questions are, how are other universities leveraging IoT? And can I make the process simpler and more reliable? Great question. Let's go to the experts here. Okay. You want to take this? Yeah, okay. go ahead. Uh, universities are a fascinating environment and also one of the most difficult for IT because they are always experimenting with the top technologies, the leading technologies, but also they have one of the most demanding users in terms of network resources. And uh, we've seen university already using IoT in multiple areas. Know, from the digital learning experience using all kind of audio video devices you know projectors uh, cameras smart boards you also have all the the facility management air conditioning the door locks uh, even the sprinklers are being controlled by IOT devices then you have also this security team the campus security you know high definition surveillance cameras uh, door locks, digital signage. The question is, well, how can we make it simple, right, to use these devices? There is ways to contain these devices, what we call the IoT containers, mm -hmm. where even though they share the same physical network, they have separate virtual environments that are isolated, that are segregated from the rest of the network. Mm -hmm. 
So in this way, I can control that envi environment and provide the QoS and all the resources that are necessary for that particular application or use, right, to operate in an optimal way. Interesting. Hmm. That does sound much simpler. A follow-up question, if I may. Go ahead. We expect to gather a vast amount of information from these devices, and we'll combine it with other sources for analysis, you know, to predict progress and identify problems. Do you have any other recommendations? Andre, what do you think? Well, typically what I've seen, in the, and we've seen this with other technologies, is sometimes we'd like to jump on the new technologies and expect to have a lot of data. I think I, you know, brings up a good point on the side is really understand you know, what IoT is going to do and what you want to do with different situations, whether it be safety, whether the fact is you're trying to improve your, your student experience or help the teachers be more efficient. If you start from that perspective and see the kind of data you're collecting, as opposed to saying that all, I'm going to be collecting all this data and all these things I'm going to be doing with it, in, in some ways it becomes overwhelming for a lot of organizations out there and being able to choose the right type of solution. And often that also causes a lot of companies to go out and organizations to go out and buy things and put it in and realize it doesn't work well together, that they have different systems out there and they can't get them to work together. And so typically what we like to do is say, hey, when we work with our customers is pick a few low-hanging fruit at the beginning, get your chops around that, learn what you can build on top of that. But the second most important thing is build upon what you have already. Don't have a tendency to run out and, and buy what we saw like in the retail industry. There was a lot of excitement about location services and running out with the Bluetooth when the reality is, there was a lot already Wi-Fi could have done already and maybe just augment it with what you have. So, um, you know, when we think about the an analyzing, when we think about the monitor, we're thinking about the back-end systems is, you know, temper a lot of that and choose a low hanging fruit that you can get quick re re returns on that, that the business wants to do, and then build upon that and leverage what you have and build upon what you have out there. Um, it will save a lot of headaches and, and disappointment in the long term if you don't run out and try to tackle everything at a, at a time, but be much more focused and clear on your directions in the media term. So great advice about containing the network and making it easy to onboard and then uh, taking bite-sized chunks and growing it from there. Let's take another call. Caller, you're on the air. Hi, Larry. My situation is a little different. This is Pierre. I'm an IT manager at a small hotel. All my guests seem to care about is Wi-Fi connectivity. In my situation, do I really need to worry about IoT? That is a great question. Why don't we uh, turn to Hader? What's, uh, what would you say to Pierre? I would say you does have to worry about IoT as well. And let me give you an example. I went to Vegas recently, and um, you know that hotel offered me a online login from my smartphone hours before I arrived. So by the time I got there, you know, there was no lines for me. There was this huge line for everybody doing the check-in. I went to a short line, got my keys straight away to my room. So every time I go to a hotel now, I think about that. And if I have to choose, you know, if I have the option, I'll go to that hotel. And a lot of the small hotels are boutique hotels that do a more personalized, a better yeah. customer experience than the large hotels. So there is multiple IoT technologies being used now uh, in the rooms, you know, for controlling the lights, the TV, um, cameras, door cameras, the curtains, um, you know, even the door lock, right, of, of your room. So there are plenty of opportunities for you to differentiate and take advantage of IoT. I would even say for the caller itself, if you even look at the operational side of a, of a boutique hotel, at large hotels, their most expensive or largest resources is the humans cleaning the rooms and catering everyone. Usually, typically at a boutique hotel, you have less people on staff. But what's the most expensive or one of their biggest expenditures is actually energy costs. Mm -hmm. So having the ability of, of controlling the lights and the air conditioning and TV when someone's not in the room and not doing it in a way where you put the car key in the door and, you, and it's darkened and you're fumbling around and you're frustrated because at a boutique hotel, you expect a wonderful experience walking in there. So why That's not, true. as you approach the room, with geofencing or with some of the Wi-Fi capabilities of location services that alerts the light bulb in the room to come up to set maybe even a certain color scheme that you prefer in the room itself, even set the temperature and even have a music and they don't have to worry about the car key and fiddling around and, and finding a lights in the room and stuff like that. So, you know, from an IoT perspective, energy and customer experience bringing that together is what would differentiate them versus some of the larger establishments out there, you know, what they have to deal with from an expenditure standpoint. 
Sounds like a great way to save money, be more sustainable, and have a great yep. customer experience. Yeah. All right, our next caller is calling from Las Vegas. Yo, Larry, Sal Baducci, IT director of a large resort and casino, and my question deals more with security. We deal with millions of dollars in cash and transactions daily, so security is our top priority. We keep our financial transaction network totally separate from our main infrastructure to minimize breaches, but it's overwhelming our IT organization. Any recommendations? What a good question. With all the problems you hear about hackers, Hitter, why don't you uh, give some advice to our caller? Sure. Yeah, he does have a very valid concern, especially with the amount of money they manage every day in a casino. And we've seen many of the customers having actually totally physically separate networks. Uh, but there are today techniques and technology to really be able to bring this all together in one common physical network but still keep separate virtual environments. In these environments, you can control who has access, what devices, right, and what applications should be talking with these devices. And if for any reason you have a cybersecurity attack, you still contain the damage. Right? It doesn't spread to the rest of your network. And uh, one of the techniques, for instance, that we can do in that environment is use DPI to analyze the type of traffic you expect coming from a certain device. I'll give you an example. Let's say I have my, you know, the property security system with all the surveillance cameras. Right. And I expect maybe a video SIP traffic coming from that device talking to a certain application. If all of a sudden I see a different type of traffic, I know maybe somebody's trying to hack into the system, spoofing the address, the MAC address of that camera. So I can immediately stop that from happening. So techniques like that can really help you secure your network, even though you're sharing a common network infrastructure and saving a lot in your capital expenditures. Sounds like it might really help Sal. How about you, Andre? Any comments for uh, Sal? Well, I would echo the fact that it really does have to be one network anyways. Um, the reality of this world of getting what you want wherever you're at is the reality is you're going to be taking security camera information. Um, you might be, it might be about a customer where they're at and feeding into some location service, not just from a security standpoint, but tying in, the, tying in maybe a slot machine and tying in different pieces of information so you understand that customer, what they want, wherever they're at, and be able to deliver the right service at the right time. And you cannot do this if you have separate systems, physical systems, and then try to, you know, hodgepodge it in the back end of the system. It has to be one network. And so then, you know, it goes to the point of putting these containers and these virtual containers and virtualized different parts and separating them out. IoT is the catalyst for these virtual network functions. Being able to spin up things as customers move around, as operations move around, as things change in this environment throughout the business, that you're going to need to put, um, you know, orient traffic, but spin up security firewalls. You know, if you do have start to see some bad uh, traffic going on, you you want to reroute the traffic in this area, and you don't want a firewall just sitting there or a piece of hardware sitting there idling and wasting money. Why not do a pay for use? Why not be able to spin up a software instance of it? or even just use it to create micro perimeters around certain data and certain things in different areas, depending on how you're identifying each one of these areas. So the reality is one is it's gonna be one network. The fact is you need access control to identify, you use different security aspects in it, and you'll be tying into these other areas that will be able to be much more agile and flexible to be where the business needs to go and react to it in this casino environment because it's slot machines, it's the food court, it's the um, entertainment, it's creating, and Vegas is all about creating an environment, creating a certain field, and that's why people go there, and uh, IoT is gonna be the leverage point to do that, and you need all this to work together to enable that to happen. Creating a single network, but securing each type of traffic on there, that sounds like a great solution yeah. for Sal. Yeah, and Andre, you brought a great point, uh, which is not only about security, it's about uh, creating this environment, and I've heard that in Vegas, now they're studying the path that people take when they go to gamble, where they conglomerate, and then can they can adjust to promotions or put people in certain locations. So you have multiple benefits yeah. that you can uh, 
extract right from this information that you have in your hands. And people are spending money everywhere. So to have a separate financial system doesn't make sense because you're spending a slot machine, you might be at ATM, you might be buying tickets to a show while you're moving. So, And if you're doing it, that's still credit card over Wi-Fi. You're still using maybe Wi-Fi to... Um, to work with uh, some of the facilities and even digital displays are going over Wi-Fi and you want to know where a person's at, digital display changes based on the type of age group or, or uh, group walking by and, and advertising those areas. So the financial aspect of it is they're spending money everywhere. It's, you know, it's happening all ubiquitously throughout this environment and uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a combination of security, financials, you know, everything is meshing together. Internet of Things for Healthcare, brought to you by Alcatel Lucent Enterprise. And we're back. We have another caller. Let's see. It is Linda, Director of Patient Services at Feel Better Healthcare. Linda, what's your question? Hi, Larry. At our hospital, we're using connected devices to capture patient data and keep track of medical inventory and equipment. We're concerned about data overload for our physicians. Any thoughts on how to streamline everything? Oh, that's a great question, Linda. Andre, what do you think? How do we keep doctors and nurses from getting overwhelmed? Well, I think uh, the reality is the perception around IoT that all, everything can be connected is going to be shuffled to the doctors and nurses. When the reality is you think about door locks, you think about security cameras, you think about HVAC systems, that's going to go to facilities managers, that's going to go to the security team. I mean, that, a lot of IoT is, is not going to be directed towards the medical staff. And the reality is that now you have everything connected, you can actually all the exact same information, you can give it to them, they can be very mobile, and actually simplify it too, because you start to have this data from different areas to be aggregated together, and insurance forms into one thing. You start to really simplify the overall operations. Ultimately, what IoT will be delivering is much more of a simple environment that's more cohesive and much more in tune with the, the patient and where the hospital wants to go. You have devices talking to other devices to do very repetitive operations, so you simplify tasks. Many of these devices are talking to other softwares or devices. They are aggregating the data. They're extracting, ev eventually as they evolve, right? They will extract the more relevant information yeah. and only that is pushed to the human being. So the idea is not to complicate, it's really to simplify their their daily activity. Well, I was gonna say, I predict that, you know, the, the rule, the 80-20 rule that gets used in a data center, the 80% of the uh, traffic and data says east-west between VMs or different, in, in a sense of microservices, I bet you we're going to see the exact same thing in the IoT world, right? I mean, you've got light sensors are not going off. What they're doing is sharing to it to an overall controller that might be, you know, controlling the lights or the information back and forth on the situation. But I completely agree. I think we'll see the 80-20 rule in the, in the IoT world. Yeah. This brings up another point. Obviously, we're going to have door locks and, and that kind of data that, that's not very sensitive, but we're going to also have personal health information that is more sensitive. How do we create an IoT environment that can allow both of these things to exist and, and not cross over and not expose patient data to places where it shouldn't be? The same things we talked about in uh, with the casino and the finances across that type of platform will see much the same thing within the healthcare industry. And I think one of the things we forgot and we were missed to bring up specifically with finances is tunneling and encryption, not just of understanding the data and protecting it, um, doing micro parameters around it, you know, identifying and, and doing access control around the devices and users and applications coming in. But the third thing is um, data in transit. We'll see much more encryption across mm -hmm. for, for any of the types of traffic. And it would probably be, we'll start to see it across it, you know, every piece, whether it be video, whether it be patient data, you know, in this in this arena itself. I mean, it's the only way uh, to really offer that type of secure environment uh, for, especially in situations like that, whether it be the finance world or the healthcare world. Now that we know that this data can be protected and we know that it's not going to overwhelm the doctors and the nurses, what are you guys' thoughts on uh, the future of the Internet of Medical Things? It's here already. I mean, I have clients, I have healthcare providers that actually have more IoT devices on the network than they do ta tablets, desktops, mm. printers, uh, uh, mobile phones. A lot of them have been dealing with for some of this for the last few years already. Oh, I don't know. Do you, are you seeing the same thing? What are your clients telling? Yeah. One example that I, I read recently is the, I think it's called the Humber River uh, Hospital in Canada. They are a fully digitized hospital. 
uh, they have uh, some amazing things. Let's say the food, you know, uh, is delivered through this uh, automated guided mm. cart that goes through the hospital. There is nobody in the uh, prescription uh, area, so there is a robot that actually you just say what you need, what kind of medications a patient need, and automatically the robot goes and grab all the medication, you know, minimizing contamination, minimizing chances of errors. Um, you have the blood exams also I ca I, are carried by robots from you know the floor where the patients are to the laboratory. Hmm, so all these uh, back office activities are automated, right? And um, all of the patients and nurses in that hospital use a location device, so they always know where they are, minimizing paging uh, in the hospital, uh, leveraging the wearables, you know, and you measure the blood pressure, heart. Uh, rate, uh, blood sugar, right, and minimizing the needs for these patients to go to the hospital. You know, drops the cost, improves the, the way the patients heal, right, from, from whatever they are suffering. So there is a lot of potential in examples that we see, you know, nowadays. Well, you bring up about the locations. It's interesting that, um, you know, I've talked to some hospitals that are using that. A lot of times it's because people repetitively go into the room who are doing the same job and don't realize someone's been there already before they even get, you know, mark on the, on the board or they do something in there and say that they've been there already. That's a lot of time wasted between like the nurse's station or wherever they're at and traveling in that area. You think about per dollar hour for that uh, medical staff, that's expensive and that's a huge savings when you don't have that redundancy, three or four people going to the same room realizing that someone's already been there or even in a major situation, you only need you know, two medical personnel as opposed to six running into the room. Uh, you know, we hear these things all the time on what these IoT situations can deliver for an institution like that. Transportation and the Internet of Things, brought to you by Alcatel-Lucent Enterprise. And we're back. Okay, next up is Jim. He's an Intelligent Transportation System Director for the Department of Transportation. Jim, you're on Larry Rose Live. What's on your mind? Hi, Larry. I was wondering about transportation. Could IoT help in traffic jams and congestion? Well, let's see here. Huh. Every day, automobiles are coming smarter. Some can even drive themselves these days. Are we heading down the road to Carmageddon, or can IoT make <laughs> driving more efficient? Well, I think IoT can and is already helping, you know, our freeways and our driving experience. Uh, I was recently talking to one of the Department of uh, Transportation of one of the states, and uh, they actually have every third of a mile a sensor to detect the traffic and cameras. So, and uh, you know, with that, they can control, you know, the display signs that they can actually change the maximum speed in a certain area. They can control traffic lights. So all this intelligence is being used to already help minimize the traffic. And the interesting point that they mentioned is that mm -hmm. the return on investment to this for every dollar they spend is nine times larger. So it's a clear ROI for this type of, uh, of utilization of, of IoT. Um, they also have many other things, right? They have uh, radars, weather stations to tell the conditions of the roads and, you know, warn uh, passengers. Um, they have all the AM, FM uh, radio notification of, you know, what's going on on the roads. There is quite a lot already being used. And I would say not just even the roads themselves of transportation, but you take a look. I've been working with a lot of clients who are for um, you know, Metropolitan Bus and uh, Mass Transit. And we think about the mass transit area, especially the rails, um, you know, with the, the braking systems now. I mean, it's not just a U.S. problem, but we've seen it globally. And the fact is, is that humans are just not good enough to control some of these vehicles from a safety perspective. And so you see a, the braking, automated braking systems being rolled out. But the reality behind it is not just on the train itself, but you got to understand the conditions down the road and, and feed the entire system to have a, a more intelligent braking system on there. So you're starting to see globally... Uh, countries and metropolitan cities really push to get these systems systems rolled out. So you're seeing, and in, in, in that they're using cellular Wi-Fi, they're using satellite technology, and really binding together Zigbee uh, sensors and information from different areas to help improve the safety for those for those trains themselves. I mean, across the board, 
from a transportation, IoT is going to be a, a game changer for a lot of these uh, very transportation industries. So at what point does automation become maybe even a problem? I mean, we talk about some of these self-driving cars and there's been accidents and deaths already involved with those. Do you foresee IoT helping out this situation or do you think it can contribute maybe to you know, some more of these type of accidents where technology um, doesn't do what we want it to do? Well, I would say if you take a look at the accidents out there, they are actually human caused. Most of them that, uh, that comes up in the news where someone else has done something, people are horrible drivers, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And we make mistakes all the time and that maybe take that element out of them. And I would say if you have a controlled area and you start doing experiments in an area where it's just 100% automation, I think you'll find a uh, large difference in crash rates and safety factors in those environments. When, I don't know if you're... No, no, that's right. Uh, and we need, we need to remember these are very complex systems. Right. Uh, it's not... Uh, there are so many variables. Mm -hmm. So we need to give also time for the technology to evolve. So I think overall the benefits are, are large. Well, you look at the uh, aircraft in the world today, they've tried to take most of the human element out of it, especially military aircraft. Uh, humans cannot keep up with the turn radiuses on them and the, the thrust that a lot of these aircrafts are performing, the maneuvers that they're performing in the air is all being done. Um, some of them are designed to be unstable and use automated system to keep them stable because that makes them a little bit more agile. So we start to take that into account when it comes to uh, automobiles. And some of the Department of Transportation are already experimenting with the interface with the cars. And for instance, they could you know, but knowing, they say, the timing of a traffic light, they can help already the car start braking in a safe way, you know, in, yeah. in a cross section. So there is quite a lot of possibilities to, to improve, you know, the overall traffic management. Uh, a lot of the braking is because people are on their phones, eating, flying, uh, grooming themselves, playing with the radio. I mean, you start to let you know, something else take over and, and you can reduce that kind of distance between each other and increase the amount of uh, cars on the road. Well, I'm kind of glad I went to see Sully before uh, all the pilots were <laughs> replaced by IoT. Jim, did that help out? One more thing, Larry. Go ahead. Well, we're always sharing surveillance footage with law enforcement, but we'd like to limit that information to only what is necessary. Can we limit what is shared with others? Ooh, good question. Hmm. Privacy is a big issue here, not to mention just the sheer amount of data that you have to sift through. Hater, any yeah. thoughts on that? Yeah, that's actually a very interesting question because, uh, you know, many of the departments of transportation, they don't operate like a traditional corporation, right, where they only are concerned about their own domain, they, only, they control their own domain. Uh, these entities, they do have to share information with other public entities. You know, think when you drive your car, you cross from uh, one city to another, from one county or from one state to the other. So they all have to share information so they can keep the flow and the information going. One example, is, as he mentioned, right, is the surveillance cameras, right? Uh, you may have to share that with the first responders, with the police department. Uh, and there are, you know, again, techniques that can virtualize this segment, this uh, logical functions into your network. And then you as put, let's say, the surveillance cameras in one segment, you put your radar information in another, um, you know, the traffic lights in another. And this way you can pick and choose what you want to share in a secure manner. Mm -hmm. And another thing is these departments have to try to uh, search for technology that is simple to operate because they are running mm -hmm. very slim. You know, this one of the states have only four people in their IT organization wow. to, to manage the entire state. So you imagine, mm -hmm. wow. yeah, it's critical for them to think about how simple it is to operate the network, how can they easily share and collaborate with others. And, and keep in mind that sometimes they have to reach outdoors and provide connectivity in areas that are very harsh, right? They're in the middle of the road. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's a very interesting um, situation that they have, but there is definitely technology to support that. Well, terrific. Andre Kindness, analyst from Forrester Group, Hader Ferroni, uh, Alcatel Lucent Enterprise, IoT architect. Gentlemen, thank you both for thank you. joining us today. And until um, next time, this is Larry Rose saying good night.